Well, thank you so much. I am very grateful to be allowed to be here today, and thank you to our chairs for including me. I'm, 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 just, I'm just flabbergasted I could be included with such greats as the likes that have gone before. So thank you very much. Dr. Minasali and I are going to take you through uh, thoracic pedicle screw placement with this particular robot. And one of the things I wanted to start off with is uh, the planning, because I think planning is how we get success. I'm a huge proponent of planning with the preoperative CT scan for uh, several reasons, uh, not the least of which is um, that I think it gives you an opportunity to take the stressful parts of that, that process and take them away out of the operating room so that you can do that thought, you can make your tweaks and changes. And I agreed with the speaker that said earlier, it's good to have a day, a night to sleep on it and then make any changes you wanna make the next morning and really uh, uh, have that plan be where you want it to be. One of the things that's nice about preoperative planning is you can plan the screws that you need to use, that you, that you want. You wanna maximize that minimal pedicle, engage that cortical bone, get the right length. And one of the things that I have found in my experience doing uh, robotic surgery is that I'm using larger screws and I'm also placing them in trajectories that I wouldn't have done on an open. I would have looked at the exterior anatomy and thought, oh, it's going that way. But when you have that CT scan, you can see it is a little bit different. And um, I've been very, very pleased uh, with this process. So on the screen, there's a, you can look at an XYZ axis and you can actually march down the pedicle and see uh, where that is going and make sure that you're engaging in that actual bone. You're then gonna go on to do the registration. I have a, um, a little bit of glare on the screen there for me, but I think I hit the right button. Um, when we uh, register, uh, the, you know, the, the different platforms are gonna have a slightly different protocol, but you're basically linking what that preoperative CT scan is to where the patient is in the world. And so you're gonna have a reference frame, you're gonna have a, a, a sky, a, a, an auxiliary ball, uh, blanket on the name for that right now, but that one tells you whether it's been moved or not. You're gonna have the end effector here, and these all have to be in line of sight of the camera. And if they're not, then you're gonna get an error message on the, on the robot machine itself. So uh, Dr. Minasali and I, we're gonna take you through some of these pedicle screws. So why don't we start off, we'll say T5. So I'll go ahead and send the robot to that location. And then, um, I guess we should have pointed out that we already did our anatomy check with our chicken foot, but we can show that for you as well, just to confirm that we are where we think we are. We will start off with the burr, and this is just a light dusting to get that opening for the, uh, the, the router bit to go down. And so this is gonna be in line. We can see on the screen that we're headed in the right trajectory. Can you see the screen? Is there too yes, much? Thanks. Okay. And so you're just gonna lightly touch and let that, uh, you can go spin on this one um, and just let it open up that little bit of the cortex there so you have a nice spot to place your drill. All right, that looks good, come on out. Now, if you have two instruments in the camera field, it, the computer can get confused. So your techs are gonna basically place them down. Now we wanna keep the balls dry so that they don't get, uh, they don't suffer any uh, changes there. Now, if for some reason, let's just say somebody carelessly, the attending carelessly comes in here and pushes the robot away, we can always remove the instrument out of there, cover up the balls, and then press on the foot pedal and redirect the machine and get back to that perfect trajectory again. And so now we're just going to lightly touch. Uh, we're in the divot that the burr made, and we're just going to lightly touch, and go full speed, and let the power take us down the pedicle. Really don't want to be shoving, uh, just let the weight of the instrument go down. The gentleman that taught me how this technique was named Guillaume, Dr. Guillaume. So I, we always call it Guillaume hands. You want nice Guillaume hands on that. And once you get down, it'll show you where you are on the screen there. Go ahead and come on out. I'm mentioning this because uh, this is my preferred technique, is to tap the screw hole. Um, but however, we're using very narrow screws here. So I, when I get to the four fives and the five fives, I generally don't tap. But when I'm at six five, seven five, eight five, nine five, ten five, I am gonna tap. So this is, this is how we would do it. Uh, but we're just gonna make a little bit here for the demonstration. And then you can go ahead and take that one out. Now what's nice about this particular screen is that the technician can see what screw you're gonna use. 
And so they can preload it for you and have it ready to hand you. And then uh, as you move to the next trajectory, they can get ready with the next screw. I do prefer to use a headless screw system. Um, that way they're kind of out of my way when I'm doing my bony work, whether it be a laminectomy and a osteotomy or, or the like. And did you get your check mark? Are you, are you down? Yep. Yeah. Oh, good job. All right. Now, I did talk a little bit uh, in one of the comments about the serpentine pattern where we weave ourselves back and forth, starting from the top more towards our array. And the reason for that is that you can pull the, the, the body uh, from side to side doing that. This will help compensate for that. There are, of course, instances where uh, for technical reasons, you might need to do a couple uh, in a row on one side. That's fine. Just be aware that that's a possibility that the body's getting pulled towards you. All right. Wow, it's actually easier for me to look at that one there. So here we are just making a little, little tiny divot for me to put my drill in. There we go. And I'm going to take my drill and I'm just going to make sure that I'm in line that I'm getting my proper trajectory there. It looks like doing pretty well. I'm going to go full speed. All right. Normally I would tap on the, uh, with the larger screws. Again, we're using smaller screws here, so really not necessary. The drill is the correct size. And there we go. I'm getting our screw back. So we can see coming down and we're following the uh, plan that we had. Now, when we say serpentine, the next one I would do, and this is maybe just a matter of efficiency, uh, but I'm actually gonna go to the next one down on my side, and then I'll hand it back to Dr. Minasali. There are times where the patient will be moved enough that you'll need to re-register. And it's important to be able to recognize that. Having the array uh, uh, in line with the camera the whole time, you, you're, going to be, what? you're going to be able to um, figure that out. There are warning signals that will come up if the anatomy is grossly off. However, uh, you're going to want to use some common sense there as well. So you, you want the people around you to be very gentle. Thank you. And there we go. You'll notice, I don't know if you can see for the overhead camera, but the spine is moving here as we're inserting this screw. And some of that force is getting, is being pulled up in this trajectory here. All right. Get back up, Dr. Nick. Thank you. There are times when the arm will not be able to reach the trajectory that you want without impinging on the body, particularly in high lumbar lordosis, uh, on the, where we have our, our cervical thoracic junction as well. And in those cases, you may need to invert the arm. Uh, and that's fairly easy to do. Um, here, let's see if we can, I think there's some tissue on that. There we go. It's fairly easy to do. You just unclick the screw, grab the collar, and the arm can be inverted, which will allow you to get those trajectories. Again, that's usually a problem down here uh, at uh, L5, S1 on those high, high angles. You can feel it, right? Mm -hmm. So they talk about the haptic feedback. You can, you can actually feel when you're, when you're in. All right.
These are the blunt tip screws. Where he made the hole is where the screw is gonna go. And then um, with redirections, if you have a, a revision case and that sort of thing, I agreed with the speaker that mentioned earlier about tapping. So you start off the small taps and work yourself up. And that way you have given the, the screw the best chance of going down the hole that you wanted it to go down. Um, checking with the ball tip feeler is a great way to confirm that. And um, you might have to get a ball tip feeler that's a little bit longer in order to get it past the sleeve here, or you can enter in from the side. Sometimes this happens if, and you can just back it up a little bit and then take it out. All right, let's go, why don't you hit T7 on your side? You got it? Excellent. Now, some mention about using the robot as a teaching tool, and uh, we certainly do at our place and enjoy it a great deal in that regard. Uh, because you have the ability to see the anatomy, particularly if you're doing a near percutaneous situation, most of the screws that I'm gonna end up placing are gonna be transfascial. And so being able to see the anatomy on the screen uh, underneath the muscle layer that we're looking at, uh, I think is helpful for the, the people on the other side of the table. Now, it's been a while since I've been a fellow and maybe they'll tell you something different in private, but I think it's helpful. There you go, excellent. Once this screw is placed, I'm gonna give you a little, uh, show you how we'd invert the arm on those cases that we need to. Now when we invert the arm, the position of the end effector is gonna be different. And so the camera will frequently need to be moved to a different trajectory in order to see that. So we may need to move the camera over to the other side of the All right, so before we move the camera, I'll, I'm gonna go to this one here and we're just gonna, there we go. So let's say for whatever reason, I can't reach this trajectory because I'm gonna impinge on some structure that can't be compromised. Yeah. You know, you can assume if you were down here or up here, maybe it's the head. All right, so here we are, what are we gonna do? Well, we can unclick the screw we can grab the collar and push it and then move the end effector into this position. So now we've inverted the arm, we reclick the screw and send it. And as long as the camera can see the end effector, we'll be okay. We might need to move the, that camera slightly to the side. Yep, go that direction. But this is a good workaround for those people that um, when you're dealing with those, those high grades. So a little less convenient when you have the arm in your, in your chest, but it is a way to get those screws that you can't otherwise get, which has been uh, a challenge for me because I do like to keep people in the Jackson table as much as possible so that we're fusing them in an anatomic position. Our previous speaker had mentioned what his uh, dream combination would be of endoscopy and robotics. And I will say that my dream combination is gonna be a, the overlay of my reality and the reality of the patient so that I'm no longer looking at the screen, but I'm actually looking at the patient and seeing this stuff. So that's my, that's my wish list there for the companies. So please get working on it. Uh, <laughs> That's really basically how, we, how I do it. Uh, again, I think the key fundamentals here are to make sure that you have your reference array uh, in a way that it can be seen the whole time, that you do your anatomy check, 
that you're very gentle, that you use soft hands. Um, this high-speed burr is a very helpful tool to make that initial divot so that you can avoid the skive. Having a flat tip router type bit is very helpful as well because it makes it difficult to push it into the wrong direction. Just let this gently go down through that area. I'm a big fan of tapping, uh, particularly as you get to the larger diameter screws. At any point, if you feel like you need to check a fluoro image or use your ball tip probe, by all means do so. I think that it's helpful to build that confidence in the robotic platform there. And then um, it's imperative that you be cognizant of the fact that as you're doing these maneuvers, you're going to be manipulating the spine underneath you. That effect will be exaggerated the more cephalad you are uh, away from your array. And so it's nice to start at the top, work yourself down in a weaving pattern so that you can compensate for that. So I imagine everybody's hungry. Um, I will uh, take questions during lunch, if that's okay with the team. Sounds great. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. Great. All right, lunch break. So we're breaking for lunch. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.